Okay, it's just going to be really quick. Um, I've described this to a few people before <laughs> in trying to describe this uh, potentiometer universal assortment that I have. It's kind of hard to describe, so I thought I'd actually show it for once. Um, back in the day, in the, you know, long, long time, long before I was born, back in the 40s and into the 50s, I'm not really sure how long they continued to make it, but uh, IRC, or International, what is it, Resistance uh, Corporation or Company, I have to pull their uh, reference manual out here, I can never remember, uh, let's see, what the heck is it? It's IRC. What the hell does that stand for? Yeah, Consumer and Distributor Products Division. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Oh, that's nice to know. What the hell is the name of your company? IRC. That's all it says. <laughs> I can, like I guess I can never remember. I think it's International Resistance Corporation it was. But anyhow, they had uh, a line of universal controls. And they had their Q line, which was you know, pre-assembled, already made, but they had their uh, Concentra kit uh, kits and the Spectral line, and what you could do was was actually build a control from scratch. So, uh, you know, you came up with it, because there's, you think about it, there are literally thousands, tens if not hundreds of thousands of possibilities. Now, there's only a few control elements. You know, you have different tapers, you have linear, logarithmic, reverse taper, you have some of them have taps on them, but still, there's, you know, there's a, only a limited number of different actual resistance elements. But there's a gazillion different ways of assembling it. You can have a single, you can have a double, you can have a triple. You can have a single with a switch, a double with a switch, you know, there's push button, I mean, there's, the sky's the limit, it just goes. So you, you literally, it quickly gets into the hundreds of thousands. Well, of course, no repair shop's going to stock hundreds of thousands of different controls. But uh, back in the day, you could get the uh, Spectral line, and you could build it. So I have hundreds of drawers full of stuff like this. Now, this is a CF-16, so what I'm replacing is the volume on-off control in this Browning Mark IV. Um, this CF-16 is a 500K uh, linear taper pot, okay? Now, you'll notice there's no way to mount it, there's no shaft, and there's a hole in the back of it. But that's part of its universal nature. So, not knowing how deep or what your mounting type would be, you could change out this front piece for different mounting flanges. And in my case, I need a bushing. So I use BU... I think this is BU2. Okay, so this just screws in a little bit into the front. So there, there's our mount. There's Now we have a way to mount it. Now, I need an on-off switch because this is the volume and on-off switch in this radio. So you get this, this is what, the CG? I think this is the CG switch. Or GC. Yeah, this is the GC switch. It's just a single contact on-off switch. And it just snaps together get the holes lined up there and you'll see there's a little nib right there there's one right there and one right there and they line up with little slots in the side here so once you snap it down into this housing it locks it in so it can't move let me just stick now let's see where the hole get to and then before i even assemble that and then in other situations what you would do is um you could actually take the rear of the pot off and this would actually replace it and you'll see there's little ears there so if you needed to assemble this onto the rear or you could take you can see those locking ears there in different applications you can take this front part off and use just the rear section of the switch so like i say very universal kit i really wish they still made it um snap that in there and now we have an on off switch with a 500k pot now all we need is the shaft and i have hundreds and hundreds of different shafts there's because you got to remember when you get into double elements now this one's a single but if you had another element back here then you need an inner and an outer shaft so they have a several hundred front shafts and several hundred different rear shafts there's knurled there's round there's screwdriver slot there's plastic for your applications where the the housing might be live and you have to have a plastic shaft sticking out but uh, all you do is go through, you know, go through the, 
the, the catalog there. And that's from, I think that catalog I'm using is made in the mid 1940s. But you pick out a shaft and then it just, you can see it's got these little locking ears and that actually locks into the element inside there. And you just stick this down in your, oh, before I do that, let me grab a little bit of Earl. I always like to put, put a little bit of Earl in there <laughs> for smooth turning. Smear a little bit in there, and I'll grab a foam swab. Put a little bit more on here. Yeah, that's not blood, don't worry. It's actually uh, Texas Refinery Corporation UTF or Universal Tractor Fluid. I like it because it's extremely highly refined, and it's very tacky. It's got a cohesive oil, so it's kind of stringy. And it, it basically, it stays put, which is the reason I like it. And I'll put just a little bit on the shaft there. I don't want it so much that it's going to ooze all over the, uh, you know, inside onto the element because you don't want to be applying petroleum to the uh, <laughs> to the element itself. That will that will destroy the element. I've seen people spray WD-40 on, you know, try and use that for tuner cleaner before, and uh, it ends up, you know, six months a year down the road, all of this resistance material has literally fallen off. And then you just take this and. Stick that down in there and push it in until it snaps. And there you go. There's a new potentiometer. And then when I stick this in here, it's going to stick out a little bit farther. So I'll actually double nut it. I'll have a nut on the back side um, and then a nut on the front side because you can see there, if I spin it around a little bit, you'd be able to see it. You can see how even with it in the whole way, so what I need to do is, is get this shaft back in just a little bit more. So I'll put a nut on the inside here to set my depth, you know, so it only comes out. So when the knob's pushed in the whole way, it'll be right there, just like the one above it, where you can just see the nut in behind the control. So that's what I'll be left with about that gap right there. So there you go. That is just, but I wanted just to actually show how I build potentiometers. Um, like I say, it's taken me years, <laughs> years and years to put that assortment together. Um, I've actually bought several of those kits over the years. They were, you know, complete uh, kits, just cabinets, and can they're, car they're cardboard parts cabinets to start with. So you know, some of those you know, built in the 30s and 40s, those things are getting really fragile. So I got to be gentle with the, the cabinets. But uh, you know, all the controls are fine. You know, they've they've all been stored and. But like I say, this is uh, this is how I come up with the impossible to find. Uh, now this isn't impossible to find because it's just a 500k pot with an on-off switch and a fairly standard shaft. Now a lot of times what you'll get would be one with a long shaft, then you have to cut it off. But uh, uh, like I say, when you get oddball stuff, especially when you get controls that have a, a tap, you know, it might be let's say a 500k pot that has a tap at 250k. Yeah, it's you're not just going to go finding oddball stuff like that nowadays. So, uh, you know, this is the, the ultimate way to build your own pot. And when you're done, you're left basically with a duplicate of what you're replacing. You know, you can match up anything to anything. The, the mounting is, and like I say, there's more than just the threaded ends. There's all different types of uh, front ends you can stick on this. They even make, and you notice this has straight terminals. Um, they even have circuit board mount flanges, a little bracket you could, you know, replace this front piece with. And then you just straighten these terminals out, and that makes it a PCB mount. Um, just so universal. And then there's lots of different switches. Um, you can get multiple multiple section on-off switches. I think I've got like five or six different switch types. Um, yeah, just a really nice kit. So there you go. There's just a quick video of how the antique IRC, um, and actually it wasn't just IRC. You could get uh, element sections and whatnot, uh, Clarostat, uh uh, let's see, uh, Central Lab. Central Lab was a really popular one. Um, and actually, if you're familiar with Sam's manuals, uh, let's see if I got an old one right here at hand. Eh, it's probably not old enough. Nah. Because I'd need to go pull a Sam's manual for an old uh, tube type radio, something that would have had those old big quarter inch shaft pots. But back in the day, let's just use your imagination. And this says, you know, uh, controls. You know, they'd have the controls listed and the manufacturer's part number, but then there are several rows of part numbers. And it would have uh, IRC, Central Lab, Spectral, all the, you know, uh, Central Lab and uh, 
hell. I can't even remember the other one. I said it a second ago. <laughs> in one brain cell and out the other. Uh, but in any case, they actually listed those numbers in the SAMS manuals back in the day. So, you know, the tech could just pick up the SAMS manual. It didn't matter he was working on a TV, a radio, portable, didn't matter what it was. You know, he could just walk over to his shelf, pull out a couple drawers, get out all the sections, and with, with, in no time, he had exactly the customized special control that he needed. So, there you go. There's just a, a little view into how much easier things were back in the day. So, I was going to end the video <laughs> there, but I'll show you it actually in and working. So, here's our new control. See, I've got the, the knob depth. That just about the same as the other ones. Actually, I might need to pull it out just a hair. I always like to keep stuff like that so it looks original. Nothing, you know, it, all the knobs should be at the same depth. So I probably actually should pull that out just a little bit because it is in a little bit too far. But uh, uh, now, I can't show you the transmitter. Big secret. <laughs> that's the uh, uh, one that's getting the modern DDS VFO installed in it in place of that nightmare of a PLL module. It's done. You're going to have to wait. Now, in that video, you will see me talking about there's a problem with the receiver, and it was driving me absolutely batshit, and that problem was that control, because you'd tap the radio, the volume would come, it would go. You'd touch the... T you, I mean, literally, just barely touch it. I mean, you know, not even hardly an ounce of force. You'd touch the tone control, or the RF gain, or you'd touch any tube, any movement at all of this thing, and the volume would come, and it would go. And you'd play with the volume, and it just did not seem like it was a volume control. You'd touch something, anything in there. It's, I mean, just literally the slightest little tap, and you'd lose it. Yeah, it was the control. So it's, and you'll see in that thing, it, like I say, it would come and go. But so there you can see. Yeah, had a little bit of skip earlier. The skip cameth, and the skip went away. A little bit Spanish coming in. Yeah, nothing really on sideband. Sounds like the bowlers just, there's so many people on there you can't make out anybody. But it works now. So uh, when you get done watching this video, probably shouldn't be too long. I've got to edit the other video together and we'll get get uh, the the one you really want to see, the, the DDS VFO, <laughs> we'll get, I'll get that video edited, edited together and uploaded. So there you go.